The rolled ankle over here. Whoa, that came in clear. Timber. Hello, hello. That seems pretty loud. And so it is. Okay. Um, so, we doing all right this morning? Everyone's doing good? Ow! Uh, guys, we are doing... Uh, um, last week we uh, went over Luke 1. Uh, today, last week. It was not last week. It was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but the last time I did a message, it was Luke 1. Uh, tonight, or today, we're going over Luke 2. And um, the title of it is uh, Life of an Oxymoron. But um, so re- really the, uh, um, the Christian way of life is, is, is one filled with just uh, opposites and uh, uh, like a dichotomy of like what um, should be and what is and that sort of thing. So I'm just going to give a message basically that, um, I don't know, I just feel like it's just a, a real message. Maybe not a popular one, but a real one. And um, so anyway, when uh, Michelle and I first got together, uh, we... Uh, Michelle had a lot of ideals, like just so many ideals. I mean, she was, I'll give you a little secret, when we first met and she was really young. So because she was so young, you know, it's common that she would, you know, have so many of these ideals. Like, well, for, for example, um, she never lied. Um, her friends knew that about her. Like if, if you wanted, I mean, to, to a fault, like if, Someone, you know, she got invited over someone's house and she didn't really enjoy the food and someone asked her like, hey, did you like it? Rather than like lying, she just wouldn't answer, which would be a dead giveaway. Like, okay, that's a little awkward. So, you know, (laughs) but um, anyway, but she was just a woman who was just very like set on truth and very, um, you know, just had everything in a row. And that's just like, you know, the way she is. And here comes Dolan. Dolan comes along and is like, I will break your ideals down. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, the first thing we did was kind of funny, silly as it was, we, we went to a uh, playground that was off limits. It was like trespassing. So we trespassed, climbed a fence, just so I could say is she broke the law. Because, you know, it, silly as it was, it was just one of those things. I was like, you know, y- why? Why have these ideals? And uh, oftentimes in our, the beginning of our relationship, I would tell her, like, I mean, I am not like a fantastic dude. Like, I, that is not me. I'm not, uh, there are, I want you to get to know this right now. There, I have many faults, and I just wanted to, like, I want you to know that I'm, because I'm, I'm seven years older than her, eight years older than her, and I don't ever want her to look at me like as if I'm on a pedestal. So I had to break down these ideals, like, immediately. Um, and, you know, originally that was my intention. I think anymore I continue to break down those ideals, not on purpose, but good job, Dolan, you know. <laughs> So uh, anyway, but I, I believe the whole point of it is, is the fact that I think we bring ideals into Christianity. We bring our own ideals, maybe not even in Christianity, but in everything that we do. We're bringing these ideals that we have, these preconceived notions um, of, like, you know, how life should go. And, I, I, you know, two of those major uh, things that we see in Christianity these days is like, man, if I'm, if I'm saved, uh, you know, my problems and all my suffering and pain, it's going to go away. And, you know... I, you'll quickly find out in, in Christianity that's not the case whatsoever. I mean, we still live life like anybody else. Um, and then another common one, especially in the last decade or so, and it's crept a, its way into, um, you know, our, our way of, of Christian living and, and Christian messages that are really popular around the States is the prosperity gospel. Um, that, you know, you, like, deserve to have wealth. You deserve to, to have it all. And... Uh, um, you know, God wants to bless us, but he wants to bless us not according to what we think. Like, not according to it in an earthly way. And for the prosperity of the gospel to be so popular, I, I can't help but think, like, what happens to all the people that, you know, are so poor? That doesn't mean God doesn't love them. So I, I just feel like there's a lot of, uh, you know, ideals that we bring in. And uh, it, mainstream Christianity tries to make Christianity so easy and, and, and just so acceptable. And it's not, in a way. I mean, it's, it's still difficult. And, and I, I just feel that, um, you know, 
you know, like your K love and all that stuff. I lo- and I love, I love, you know, all these these mediums that kind of use this stuff. But people come in, and I just kind of wonder how deep the roots go. You know, from making Christianity so easy. And out of this, a byproduct of it is because um, they may not be getting a whole, a whole, shall I say, like picture of what Christianity is all about. They they get kind of prideful and boastful, but not not in a way that, say, like maybe our fathers and mothers were, and because they were such Bible thumpers. I mean, like I said this before in another message, like, you don't really see too many Bible thumpers anymore. Like, that's just not the way, you know, people aren't, like, like so proud of what they learn and know the scriptures inside and out that, like, man, they stand on it like, you know, we'd see in the Bible like the Pharisees. No, it's, it's a pride and boasting in, in a different way. And we see it all the time in social media. And, and how it looks is basically like this. It's like, hey, I'm going to give uh, a verse so that way I will increase my own following. It's a pride that says, like, I'm going to use Christianity for my own good. That's kind of what I'm seeing today. And that's an ideal in, in a different way. And so, like, we'll see verses. Here's the most common verse that is kind of used on social media. Jeremiah 20, 11, For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. And gosh, I love that scripture. I do. I mean, it's non-controversial. It's non-divisive. And it's oftentimes served with a little cherry on top. But in reality, it's, it's I mean, and, and it'll, I mean, if you post that on like Facebook, you're probably going to get a ton of likes. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. Of course you want to hear that. That is a great thing to hear. Everybody wants to hear that. You will get a ton of likes. But in reality, that verse is served out of context. If you think about it, the book of Jeremiah was a, the, the guy himself was nicknamed the weeping prophet. Okay? He was the most rejected man out of the whole of the Bible. Like, he gave a message that the Lord delivered to him and said, you will not be accepted by the people because of the message I am giving to you to give to them. And he got rejected. He got sent down into a dungeon where the dungeon, like, the mud was filled up to his waist. They almost forgot about him. They had to, like, this dungeon was so bad that they had to, like, lower a rope down and, like, har- like harness, get some towels and stuff to har- harness around it and, like, get him out of there. The guy had a horrible life. And so... He, and it was in this context that he said, you know, if you keep going around and listening to the popular people that are telling you, live life as you're doing now, God's always going to be by your side. God's going to just like, like commend you for uh, whatever lifestyle you have. But that wasn't the case. Jeremiah said, hey, you're, if you don't continue to listen, listen to the word of God, listen to his true messengers. He's going to send you off you're going to get captured by a foreign people. And it's out of that that he says, I still have plans for you. I still have a hope and a future for you. It is in the same way, guys, that I will probably never use this verse for my children when they're uh, on a high. I, I, I probably won't use it in the context of like, you know, God has plans for you, plans to prosper you when they're like, just has received something. Because that would be like me taking them to a buffet and say, God wants you to gorge yourself right? No, in reality, it would be more on the lines of like, man, we barely have any food on the table. We have barely anything at all. And God is saying, I have plans for you. There's hope for you. There's future for you. And so it's in that context, guys, do you see that 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 it applies? And so, um, I just feel like that there's a, you know, a popular part of Christianity and there's a real side of Christianity. And I mean, when was the last time you saw on on Facebook or Instagram or whatever where someone posts a message like John 3 says, truly, truly, I say unto you, you must be born of water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God. What is of flesh is of flesh and what is born of the spirit is spirit. I mean, boom, that is Christianity. Yes, let's live by the spirit. Let's not live by the flesh. But how many likes do you think that would get? How controversial would that be? Right? One is popular. The other is real. 
So we kind of want, and I'm, I'm going to confess this for myself, we kind of want Christianity that is easy, that's popular, that's in the spotlight, highly rewarding. And I, here's the thing, though. For mainstream Christianity, for like, uh, especially like the seeker-friendly churches that have like all the bells and whistles and say, hey, like we're going to make this as comfortable, as easy as possible. And for a pastor to say, like, I will never preach on hell because it's, it's not something that they want to hear. I will never preach on. And some of them will even go so far that they will never even talk about Jesus Christ because he's controversial. The very center of what Christianity is all about. Because they don't want to make the people uncomfortable. But here's the thing, though. I will never get upset about that. Here's why. For the same reason, if a person comes into my gym and says, hey, I want to lose weight. I want to get fit. I want to look the best. That I, I want that six-pack. You know, I, you know, I want to get buff. And work for whatever competition, I'll be like, great. That's what I want for you, too. I really want that. And I will, as they get their results and they achieve what they want to achieve, I will, like, pat them on the back and say, Man, I'm so, I'm, we're doing this, you're doing this, and I will commend them until the days, like, until the end of days. But there's something that I like more than that. When the person who comes into the gym, and it's kind of past the days of the results, it's kind of past the initial phase, where they, they're, they're kind of like, you know, I've met my results, or maybe I haven't met, you know, my final, like, what I want yet. But it's like, you know, when I hear them talk about going on vacation, and they say, you know, Dolan, I came back, and I went on vacation, but I still worked out. And I'm like, yes! You can't live without working out! Woo! That's what I want! Because it tells me something that they love it for it. They're not taking pictures of them themselves, like in the gym, saying, hey, come, you know, Come do this. This is the best thing. They're not doing it for attention's sake, which is a lot of what a lot of people do on the media, even with Christianity. They do it for the attention of it, but they don't love it for fitness itself. They don't love it. I mean, God is looking for us to look for Jesus, to seek out Jesus for himself, not for the attention of it. You guys get me? I mean, I know, I know you guys kind of see it. I mean, we all see it, right? And maybe I... I've done it too. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say I'm above it, but um, I just, you know, today my hope is the fact that like we have a, the verse that I'm going to go over is to show you like, you know, a Christianity that's much like this, the avid fitness goer. It's to show you like, man, this is what's real. This is not about what you're going to get from attention. This is not about like, the result of something. God is calling you, Christ is calling you to follow in his way for the sake of himself regardless of the reward. So, guys, let's dive in. Let's dive into the scripture. Before we begin, Lord, uh, I just pray to, today, this morning, that, Lord, you would just deliver your word in a way that uh, reveals itself in a new way, that it reveals yourself to us in a new way that you press into us, that we may find a new sense of who you are, Jesus. Bless us this morning. Amen. So, let's, uh, Luke 2. Uh, it's, you know, the context, birth of, of Jesus. That's what we're talking about this morning. Um, so, Jesus, uh, now in those days, a decree went out from uh, Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. Um, this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of, the Sir of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the ho of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. Um, in some ways, this was all very, very important because the census, again, like for the people, the, the Jewish people at that time, they recorded everything. And in order for God to actually be of, and the reason why they did that was because, you know, uh, the religion of the Bible was their very foundation of who they were as a people. And if they knew that uh, God was to come from the tribe of, of David, um, 
you know, to be, they were always looking for the signs. That really is why they kept taking censuses over and over in the Old Testament and we see in the New. Uh, While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. I want you to notice that. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and a manger. We're going to talk about that a lot. Um, And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into the heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph. And the baby as he lay in the manger... When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just he had been, just had been told to them. First thing, guys, I, I want you to know, like, it's important that... Uh, like, why did the angels, like, appear to the shepherds, you know? Why not scribes? Why not priests? Like, for one, shepherds were actually outcasts. They were incredible outcasts in, in the culture, in the city culture. Um, they did not belong. One, because they also, like, they were filthy. Literally, they just uh, hung around with animals, and they were dirty. And, uh, it, uh, for them to be, they were always, always ceremonially unclean. Because, like, one of the things for the rules was, like, you cannot touch an animal. You have to go clean yourself. Well, if that's your vocation, your occupation, you're always unclean. So they hardly ever went to the temple. They hardly ever went to church. Because they were always unclean. People looked on them as if, like, you're subpar. You, you know, you're not You're not going to church like we're going to church. So I find it interesting that, gosh, the angels came to shepherds, outcasts in the land. What I also find, though, is like shepherds, though, are very practical people. Much more practical uh, than I would say most others uh, they don't romanticize. They don't, they're not emotive. They don't really like survive on like emotions. I mean, things are the way they are. Like that's the way they, they live their lives, right? They, if things are good, the rain comes and, you know, it produces great crops, they praise God. And if it doesn't, they're just relying and just hoping and praying either which way. But I love their mentality because it's like, hey, we're just going to hit the fields no matter what. Snow, rain, dry, whatever. We've got to keep hitting the fields. There are people that are so practical, so straightforward. And so for them to have an angel appear to them, it's like, hey, man, if they appear to shepherds and they're just like, you know, you're straight shooters, you're going to believe them. I know a guy who... Uh, He's a, a, a rancher in this town. I'm um, probably out, well, out, not in this town. Obviously, there's no ranchers in this town. But, uh, like, you know, in the area. And he has such an interesting ministry. Uh, because he has all these people, like, he is not a pastor guy. He, he doesn't do this. He doesn't like speaking in front of people. He's never done a wedding. Um, but he's done so many funerals. 
And it's only because people have just asked him. They're like, they know he is a godly man. He doesn't have any cert- cert- certifications of, of being a pastor or anything like that. But they just say, hey, we don't know anybody else. Will you do the ceremony for us? And he's just known in the community. He just continuously does funerals over and over. If he is asked, he will do it. He's that kind of guy. And that's what these kind of people are. And like, I know another guy, like I have a friend, um, he's like, man, if you move, he will always be there to help you move. He's that guy. And I'm like, yeah, you're true to your word. I mean, granted, if he's gone, he's gone. But if he's around town, he will help you. And that's the kind of guy I like. He's not, he's not thinking about the emotions of his day. He's not thinking about like, well, I can't do this. This isn't lined up right. He's a practical man. So I, I find it fitting. It's, it's kind of all fitting together why God, why the angels like came to these sh- shepherds. But I sometimes think like, man, I mean, who of us probably feel like outcasts at some point? Like, like I have many times and I know there's been many occasions where I don't feel holy enough I don't feel clean enough but God comes to you God comes to us Jesus came for the lowly for the humble for the meek He came for all of us and here's another thing I like it because these shepherds are just doing what they do every day. Here's something very interesting. So they had a flock right outside of Bethlehem, right? Many scholars believe that the reason why, that mainly the flocks right outside of Bethlehem were actually, they were shepherds of lambs that would get sacrificed in the temple. Like, they were the ones that were taking care of these unblemished animals that would go to the temple to be sacrificed for God. How much more fitting that God would bring, or the angels would come to a people that deliver a sacrificial, or a lamb to be sacrificed at the temple to reveal God, the Savior of this earth, who would later be sacrificed for us. Wow. Amazing much of a blessing that is. So think about this, guys. Think about this. Wherever you are at, think nothing less of it. God wants you there. God wants you right where you're at. Because you never know what His plan is. You never know. He might be prepping you. He might be planning something that you do not see. But He's prepping you for what you're doing now so that he might give you a sign and he might give you glory. So my first point is, so never think you aren't good enough for Christ because he will always come to you when you're spiritually unclean. These were shepherds who were dirty, they were unclean, but they were doing what God wanted them to do and he came to them. Amen? We never know his plan. We continue to do what we do. And he delivers, he reveals himself to us. It might not be a sign that we anticipate, but it is a sign nevertheless. I mean, think about that for a Well, I'll get to it in a second. Second thing, the normal conditions for a, a birth, for a family to have a birth in that time, it was a huge celebration. A huge celebration. Families would come. They would celebrate a week long. They would bring musicians to the house. It would be a victorious, like a wonderful, wonderful party. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, sometimes for our girls or whatever, like we kind of, when we do birthdays, we try to do birthday weeks. (laughs) You know, it, it was a, it was a, it was a fun time. But we don't see that here. Jesus was in a manger. And by the way, just to throw a curveball at you, all those uh, pictures that we see of a, a wood carving of, of him surrounded in like a, a shed, there's no wood, people. There's no wood at all. 
Jews like like preserved it was a representation of who they were like wood trees it, it represented fertility in the land they would never cut down trees to build a house all the houses were made out of stone so if you have a nativity scene that's made out of wood it's not quite accurate I'm sorry but anyway my point is is the fact it was it was not he was not even deserved to have a hotel to not have a special inn he was with places with animals right there was no party there was no celebration family was not around and here here's what I would think though as a mom and dad if I was birthing the, the savior of the world I don't know if I'd get a little guilt and say like man this is all we have I can't believe he's being born in these conditions You know, there, there would be just the thought of like, gosh, this, this is not, this isn't right. Like, and it, I, I draw a parallel to that, to what we oftentimes probably may feel as well. It's like, and this is a bad thing about, again, social media, and I, I know a lot of people don't go on Facebook for this reason. It's like, they don't want to see all the pictures. Like, I mean, in this day and age, some people have like, like when a, a baby is born, they'll get 200 likes and all this stuff and uh, you know family and all this and there's happiness and there's a meal train for miles and whenever I I, I see that I kind of wonder well what about the person who has no family what about the person who has nobody to actually make them a meal what happens with that so I think in some ways guys we see the shepherd who's an outcast we see Jesus who has these meek conditions, who is the savior of the world, who above anything else, I mean, this is the savior of the world, the son of God. He's a God man. He should, the celebration should be like that of, of uh, Prince William and, uh, what's his, what, Kate? Kate Uppleton? Did I say that right? Kate Uppleton and their, their baby, because, you know, he's the prince of Wales, and it was like the most, uh, Thing, it was the biggest thing that was seen on TV in the last decade for the last 30 years was the birth of their baby. What a celebration that was. And yet, the Savior of our world got none of that. What? I don't understand. Guys, number two, the attention you will receive will not be an earthly one, but a heavenly one. Okay? That is why our Christianity, we live a life that is an oxymoron. We will not get credit where credit is due. It's not in it for us. If you want to follow somebody who has all the riches in the world, go follow someone else. That is not Christianity. Think about it. You're following a Christ. You're following a Christ who was born by these circumstances, who lived by never receiving credit, who got persecuted on a cross and didn't deserve it. His whole life was an oxymoron. And us being Christ followers, those that follow Christ need to expect that if I'm going to follow this man, my life's going to be the same way. Amen? Amen? doesn't mean he's not going to bless us. He's just going to bless us in a different way. There was a, there was a pastor, uh, Mark Driscoll. I don't know if you guys know who that is, but uh, he is a favorite of mine. Um, and it doesn't matter if it was Mark Driscoll, if it was uh, Tim Tebow. I, well, I liked Mark Driscoll when he was, when he, always. Tim Tebow I didn't like right away, um, mainly because I, I thought he was haughty and arrogant, actually. Um, but I liked him, Tebow, more when he had no success. When he fell out of the graces of NFL, and, but yet he still shared his testimony over and over. And I became a Tim Tebow fan. When Mark Driscoll uh, got casted out of his church, I don't know exactly. I don't know if we'll all know exactly the specifics of what went down. There's a lot of rumors. 
But when Mark Driscoll, who's the top 10 churches of the United States, he gets outcasted. And I sometimes wonder, all the world is looking at him, and he's down, and he's suffering. But yet, I think heaven is celebrating. Much like we see here in this story, do you, do you realize these shepherds saw the angels and the choirs and all of them were singing. They were celebrating. They were giving glory to God. But what was happening on this earth was Him in these meek and humble conditions. No party. Nothing. But heaven was celebrating. And I'm like, wow. Gosh. So I, I sent Mark a letter. Um, I was like, Mark, man, I know this is probably the hardest thing ever for you. And I don't know if you ever read it. But the thing is like, dude, I'm, I'm praying for you. I'm excited for you. Because I know God is blessing you now. And here's the thing. Like, we just watched, uh, anybody seen Meet the Robertsons? Like, Ro We Got Kids is that cartoon. Meet the Robertsons, like, you know. It's actually based on, like, really, like, uh, Walt Disney. Um, and uh, the guy was bankrupt until he was 50, right? And he kept, like, failing over and over and over. But he didn't get reached success. And the main point of that whole cartoon at the end was, like, this family wanted to receive this boy who kept getting rejected over and over and over. Nobody would want to d adopt him. He was an orphan. And, but he was a brilliant kid who had come up with these inventions and things like that. And uh, he, he made this invention for this family that he wanted to get accepted by, and it broke. And he's like, oh, down on his luck. And the whole family celebrated. Woohoo! You failed! And he was so blown away. He's like, yes, failing is where you learn. When you succeed, you're not going to learn much. But when you fail, you learn. I see that much in the same way that's the way Christianity is if we follow Christ who lived his whole life like that what do you expect yours is going to be like if you really are a follower so I love the fact like uh, it says in there the shepherds didn't question you know the fact that oh man this savior he didn't have the savior you know the, the normal born, uh, birthing uh, recommendations that a savior should have. He didn't get born in a palace. They didn't question any of that. They just went. It, I mean, I, I love that scripture because it just says they just left. They didn't worry about their conditions. They didn't worry about anything else, what would happen to their life. They just left and glorified what should. It says it was revealed to them a sign, okay? A sign. For today, the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. What kind of sign is that for the Savior of the world? A baby lying in cloths in a manger. They didn't question it. They are practical people. They did it. An angel's going to appear to us. We better go. We're not going to question the circumstances. I, I, I love that. I love that about the shepherds. And I love that today about people who really understand uh, what it is to be obedient. What happened to the shepherds after that? I don't think any of them. Yeah, I, like I haven't looked at them on Facebook. Yeah, that's good. I, I don't know if it, their life had changed. I, I, they probably just went back doing the same thing over and over. But was it different? Outwardly? Probably not. Inwardly? I bet their world went from black and white into color. I bet they came and, and back to the flocks and they rejoiced every day of their life. Yet they were still outcasts. Yet they were still shunned upon. 
yet they were still dirty, unclean, but they had joy. Ah, oh, wonderful. They live joy. So for us, I think it's the same way. God is trying to reveal us, give us a sign where we are at right now. It may not be big, it may not be epic, but he's trying to give us a sign. Where you're at, filth and all. And it's for us to be looking and responding immediately to that sign never know what kind of impact it is, but there's something happening on the inside of us. I mean, maybe every Monday right now, we're looking at it, ah, it's another Monday. I go back to work. Just another Monday. Blah, 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 blah. Same old, same old. But I have a feeling, if you're looking and are being and see the sign, God's going to give you joy. I love it because he says, there is great news. Great news for all people. Joy for all people. And he's saying that to each one of us. There'll be joy. You can go about your day. You can return on the Monday and say, wow, I got joy today. And, and some of, uh, I, I, there's a few organizations in town that I really think embody this. Uh, I don't know if you probably even know of them. CLDI. Do you, do you guys know, not this one yet. You jumped the gun there for me. Uh, uh, but to the next one. Uh, CLDI is an organization that works on the south side. And their whole goal, here's their mission statement. Uh, uh, their mission statement is to transform lives and empower the people of South Billings to do good works through the person of Jesus Christ. How they are doing this in some ways is actually literally taking, interviewing people, people who have a passion for Christ, and planting them right in the middle of a rough spot of town and saying, be a good neighbor. Form relationships that reflect Jesus Christ. And that's what they do. They will take people and plant them right in the middle of the south side so that way they can be a reflect uh, uh, Christ into this community. But I tell you what, they don't get much attention. They don't. And I guarantee you, on a daily basis, it's really hard because the result of the work that these people do, these families that uproot their whole family to plant themselves there. I know stories where the people have broken in their homes, have stolen from them, many things over. But yet, we have joy. Amen. Another one is a, a guy who d does a, a Dulem Ministries uh, and really has a heart. His name's Ken. Ken. Um, the Dulham House Ministries located in Billings, Montana, provides transitional housing for incarcerated men and women working to assimilate back into the community. Man, this guy, I, I was just talking to him like uh, a week ago, and things are hard for him, really hard for him. Like, he, he doesn't know how to do it. He never asked, though. He never asked anybody for anything. God always provides for him. But he loves what he does. And I can only imagine dealing with these people what that would be like. And I say these people, I could say myself. You know, I should never point the finger. But I'm saying it's rough. And yet he does it. And he has joy. In it. God has called each one of you where you're at, in the community you're in, with the co-worker, co-workers that surround you, with the friends that surround you. To be a light. He wants to show you a sign to be Christ wherever you're at, to be joy, that a joy may surround you, to be in you. So that way, it doesn't matter what the result of it is. You're doing what you're supposed to. It is a life lived with no glory and no reward. Here. But there's huge celebration of it. Huge. That, la lastly, uh, Joel, um, there's a, uh, I talked to a guy, he's a really good friend of mine, uh, a, a doc, who uh, 
went through a really hard time uh, in his marriage. Six years and uh, on the verge of, you know, divorce or whatever. Um, and yet, uh, God called them back to move back away from Billings. He uh, doesn't live here anymore. And he moved back to a place where uh, their marital problems had started, where, you know, the affairs actually had begun. And God brought them back to a place where they're like, why would you ever bring us back here? But they were listening. They were obedient. They were the shepherds that said, all right, we were build something to us. And they went. So they go back. They've been away for about four years now. And God just like has restored their marriage. He brought them back to where it, it all happened and he restored their marriage. And I like, I mean, all while I was up here, you know, I was him and up like, I was going through it with him, and I was just hearing the pain that he had, all the struggles that he was going through, uh, both from his side and her side. I mean, he was not blameless. It was on both accounts. And, uh, but they're doing really great right now. And, you know, God, since they've been there, has brought several couples in their life who are going through the same thing exact same thing um, six couples have come into their life and they've tried ministering to these couples and here's the thing though I love this response he said Dolan five of the six of the couples still went and separated he said but we still have hope we still have joy and I love that attitude I love that attitude because he's not going to stop what he's doing He's going to continue on what he's doing, regardless of the result. He's just going to keep on. For the same sake of, like, what we're trying to do here in this gym. Like, you know, I, we got some nice stuff. But, like, I want people to fall in love with fitness for fitness sake. And here at the church, for the same reason, I want people to fall in love with Jesus for Jesus' sake. Not for the attention of it. Not to get more followers, but to fall in love with Jesus. Amen? That is our life, the normal Christian life. The world has parties and ours may not seem like much. But their happiness might be fleeting, but ours will last forever. My girls... I, I hope we can raise them not being spoiled. In some ways, I, well, in, in reality, they should never know, like, our circumstances. Whether it's poor or rich, I want them to have fun, right? I want them to have joy. Because if they can learn to have joy through all things, they will never grow up. Like, being that child who's like buffet and just wants, I want more, I want more. And that's where Jeremiah 29 and 11 comes in. I have plans to prosper you and things like that. Like, that is not, I mean, that is a huge part of Christianity. But it's not to be taken out of context. God wants to bless us. He does have plans for each one of you. Plans to prosper you. But it's different. Amen.